Today we're going back to Trump's cabinet to look into everyone's favorite cabinet member, Ryan Zinke. The guy at the party you know you've heard of, but you literally can't name a single thing about. Well, he works as the Secretary of the Interior, which again, I know I've heard of it, but this isn't exactly a small country, there's a lot of interior to cover. Don't worry though, Donald Trump can fake his way through knowing this stuff. And I have to say, really talk about a very special guy that I made Secretary of the Interior. Does he know the interior? He knows it, he loves it, he loves seeing it and writing on it. Yup, that man knows what he's talking about. Zinke does sound like a special guy though, right? Who loves writing the interior of the United States? Now this guy's actually pretty cool. He was the first Navy SEAL to be elected to the House of Representatives. Although, let's be honest, you still keep Navy SEAL above representative on the old resume. So first, what is the Department of the Interior? Well, it's the department in charge of managing most of the federal land and resources. You know, like national parks and monuments. That's probably why their seal looks like it was designed in a drum circle by guys with man buns. Alright, so what does Ryan Zinke bring to the table besides presumably the ability to kill a bear with his bare hands? Well, he's smart, and he's from Montana, and when it comes to the interior, well, that's definitely in the interior of America. Now, it gets a little weird, but some people say he's a geologist. I said, I'm a geologist. But, like, he wasn't actually a geologist, he just majored in geology, so that's kind of a thing. Although if you major in something, that doesn't give you employment in that industry, otherwise we'd have a lot more liberal artists. Still though, he probably knows his rocks, and that's probably gonna help with land management. So what's his thing? Our country is a heritage and energy dependent country from previous generations. And in recent years, we've struggled to be self-sufficient in producing low cost, abundant, and reliable energy. But a new era is dawning. With American leadership, innovation, and good ideas, our challenge will be to pass energy dominance onto our children. And we'll get into the benefits of that. But you start getting problems when the guy in charge of national parks says things like, Everyone loves our nation's parks, certainly I do, and we want to make sure energy is part of that. Yeah, we love our nation's parks. We just need to make sure we keep destroying them as part of the conversation. If you love something, set it free. In the last year, Mr. Zinke has torn up Obama-era rules related to oil, gas, and mineral extraction, and overseen the largest reduction of federal land protection in the nation's history. The largest reduction of our nation's federal land? Woohoo! Breaking records! To be fair, we did spend the vast majority of our nation's life increasing the size of our federal land. Sorry about that, Cherokee. But today, we're going to be talking about, is this a problem? Because again, Zinke didn't get to where he is on a, eh, the national parks are too big platform. Instead, he's a major proponent of energy dominance, a concept we'll get into in a second. And that could have some real advantages. Instead of invading Iraq, we can just invade Yosemite for its oil. So first, let's look into Ryan Zinke's argument about energy dominance. Because while I know America's funding some world-class infrastructure projects, I'd just prefer if they weren't all in Iraq. So first, what is energy dominance? Here's Ryan Zinke from CPAC 2018. Numbers will show you, we produce today about 10.3 million barrels a day in this country, and for the first time in 60 years, we're a net exporter of liquid natural gas, and that's President Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm sorry, just look at Secretary of Energy Rick Perry, though. That is definitely the look of a Secretary of Energy who realized that America's landlord might be doing a lot more for energy policy than him. Energy dominance is when the U.S. is not only independently producing enough energy to sustain itself, but producing enough energy to be a large exporter in the rest of the world. Frankly, newspapers across the board recognize that this is a possibility. Why? Because... I'm a former geologist, and I say former because uh, I graduated in 1983 in geology, uh, but things have changed as, you know, for, even since 10 years ago. Fracking is a game changer. Uh, as it turns out, not only do we have 
energy, but we have the most potential energy. We kind of had a Beverly Hillbillies moment just a few years ago when fracking really kicked into gear and we realized we were sitting on a gold mine of natural gas. The question now is, should we take this opportunity to become energy dominant? Today with the help from quotes from our Secretary of the Interior, as well as my own personal research, I hope to present the positives and the negatives of this Trump era energy policy. First, because I'd like to start out happy, let's focus on the positives. Take it away, Ryan Zinke. No one is better at producing energy as far as environmental standards than the US. If you want to look at catastrophes overseas, the Middle East and Africa, as a former SEAL, I've been there. It is better to produce energy here under reasonable regulation than watch it get produced overseas with no regulation. Now, that might sound like a weird one-off side argument, but trust me, this guy says it a lot. Reasonable regulations than watch it get produced in countries that don't have any regulatory framework under reasonable regulation than watch it get produced overseas with no regulation. There are more, but you get the gist. This guy loves energy regulation. The president, for every regulation put in, we remove 22. Well, uh, never mind. Still though, you have to cut a warehouse's worth of red tape to get to the level of environmental protection that some of these producers are operating at. Nigeria, for example. Although most of the developed countries that are noteworthy oil producers have similar levels of regulation we do, but by god if we're going to keep it that way. Alright, weird way to start this, but let's push on. You know, it allows us to look at, for instance, Iran. Iran's launching ICBMs, we should be concerned. You, there's two approaches, military or economic. Economic mm -hmm. is energy. Same thing with putting pressure against Russia to subplant liquid natural <coughs> gas in eastern and central Europe. So Meaning that we go ability. ahead and export our, our liquid natural gas to those European countries so they can no longer be cut off by the Russians every time they get upset with them? Absolutely. So that's actually two potential benefits wrapped into one. First, let's check out Iran. Whoa, your country's exports are more than 50% petroleum? No flashing red weak spots there. And if you think I'm exaggerating, it was just announced the other day that the US is demanding that India, amongst other countries, boycott Iran's oil until they stop doing things we're not a fan of. And well, this stuff doesn't grow on trees, they have to get it somewhere. Now to the other side of the coin that he mentioned with Russia. President Trump put gas at the top of the business agenda in Poland. And America stands ready to help Poland and other European nations diversify their energy supplies so that you can never be held hostage to a single supplier. Up to now, that supplier has been Russia. Our European allies get pretty much all of their gas from Russia, but cutting off natural gas for political gain? Nah, that doesn't sound like Russia. Ukraine's gas tap has officially been turned off. Russia's Gazprom and Ukraine's Naftogaz have failed to solve a price dispute that's been bubbling away for months. Now Moscow says it's time to pay up. Ukraine's interim prime minister is accusing Russia of using gas to destabilize the country. That was reported four years ago. And since then, well, Ukraine definitely paid for that gas. What the US could do with energy dominance is supplant Russia as the main supplier of natural gas and give Europe a certain amount of independence from Russia. Lastly, and obviously, We don't want to be held hostage by foreign entities. Yeah, and furthermore, I think I can speak for most people when I say, I'd love it if our gas prices weren't dictated as much by Middle Eastern politics. They changed so much I think the hardest working guy in America last year was the gas price change guy. That poor unspoken hero of our economy. So there are the positives meant to get you hyped up. But now let's talk about the negatives. Because, well, the plan unsurprisingly is not perfect. First, and this is not a small thing, but very few people talk about this. The US energy sector operates privately by auction. Which, while I'm not opposed to it on its own merits, does pose a problem when your goal is energy independence. Now, it took me a suspiciously long time to find out who wins bids for drilling on US public land. But I can tell you, it gets weird. Take it away, Rick Perry. We've all seen energy used as a political tool to hold other countries hostage. And that is an act of economic aggression that needs to be confronted. 
And one of the most important actions we can take is to use our massive shale gas resources to begin shipping liquefied natural gas overseas. The United States of America will use our energy resources to advance energy security. And today I am excited to announce the department has authorized the construction of the Golden Pass LNG facility. Heck yes, we're not gonna let other countries bully us around with natural gas. We're opening up the Golden Pass LNG, the largest light natural gas facility in the world. So who's running this facility? Shell? Texaco? No. Qatar Petroleum owns a majority share in the Golden Pass LNG plant, one of the largest LNG facilities in the world. Well, that doesn't sound like an American company. In fact, one of the biggest investors in natural gas fields is Statoil, a Norwegian company. Statoil produces shale oil and natural gas in North Dakota's Bakken region, the Eagle Ford of Texas, and the Marcellus of Pennsylvania. Despite that, currently Saudi Arabia's national oil company Aramco is in talks to acquire part of that Texas's Eagle Ford light natural gas site. Basically, what I'm saying is, getting energy independence through opening up new land for development is like getting people to be less suspicious about your emails by deleting them all. American firms are successfully bidding on some natural gas mines, but it's not as many as I would hope. Secondly, and again, this isn't inherently bad on its own, but a newsflash, the US doesn't have a national oil company. Again, this isn't bad on its own, but you can't pretend that the interests of Texaco and America are aligned. Saying that the US will send natural gas to our ailing allies based on alliance would be like assuring Greece that if things get worse, Goldman Sachs will bail them out. I mean, we can control some of the oil flow through sanctions or anti-free market executive orders, but these companies are in business to make money selling oil, and rightly so rather than to help Joe the plumber turn on the lights if there's ever an embargo. Lastly, there's the more Ryan Zinke concern of, those are the bear's ears, but they are just a tiny piece of this huge fight because Bears Ears National Monument is 1.35 million acres. That is over 2,000 square miles of wild western vistas holding a potential fortune in oil, gas, and uranium underneath tens of thousands of Native American ruins. Don't worry, the well drilling rights were sold on 85% of that land to Canadian uranium firm Energy Fuels Resources. Woohoo! American energy independence. So yes, we're selling land for foreign and domestic companies to compete for mining rights. Hey, at least the US government's making money in these sales. Although, that kind of feels like putting $20 into a claw machine and getting a small stuffed Rastafarian banana out of it. You gotta carry it around forever. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating Trump's cabinet, subscribe to our YouTube channel for our weekly episodes. As always, thank you for watching.